would say that the most important element in the world of Tron is light. I think that transcends our film and the first film. When you look at the first film, you think of the lines of light that kind of define the characters and the architecture and the vehicles. That's very similar to our film. Our film's a different universe, a different world. It's a much more evolved virtual space, but light is definitely the thing that links everything together. Once you go into Tron world, everybody's got some light, or you can't come to the party. <laughs> beautiful the effects the look of it you know at first glance just how unique it looks no one's ever seen anything like it but the director Joe Kaczynski is a designer and an architect and he comes at this film with a unique perspective that really creates something new it's always interesting to me where directors come from in Joe's case he's coming from architecture he's an architect and so the, the world of Tron has this reality to it that's very grounded. Well, I'm just wondering if we can kind of get at least along the bottom span and we can clad again so it's one long, smooth kind of bone line. He's got an incredible eye, he's got an incredible design sense. And I've never ever worked with a director that spent as much time and as much focus on the production design of the film as much as Joe has. It's definitely rooted in the look of the first film. You know, the DNA of the original Tron is inherent, I think, in the film. You know, the idea is that the server was cut off from the real world in the 1980s. It has developed free of the internet. This is not a movie about the web. This is a world that has grown on a server and become something very potent and unique. This is the evolution of Flynn's world in cyberspace. You can almost think of it as a cyber Galapagos where it has evolved on its own. The lines of light that flow seamlessly throughout the architecture and the vehicles and the costumes is probably the most important theme of the film. The look of Tron is dark silhouetted objects bathed in atmosphere with, with low-lying clouds kind of nested between in a kind of Japanese uh, landscape painting. And then the, the, the dominant light source is the self-lighting of things. It's, it's the Tron lines. What they've added to this world in comparison to the last is a grander sense of geography. I mean, there's the lightning storms and the weather, and there's also the, the cliffs and the mountains and atmosphere and rain and wind and all these things that they weren't able to do in the first film. But my kind of justification was the simulation has over time gotten more and more realistic, and it's tried to kind of create a simulation of the real world. There's Tron metal, there's Tron rain, there's all kinds of physical things that uh, were, were not achievable in computer graphics in the original, which now, thanks to the advances in games and everything else, that ever, everyone sees real-time computer graphics that look so amazing now, it seemed only natural to bring those physical properties and phenomena into the Tron world. When we cut to those shots inside, that's an open-air thing. you got to yeah. feel the, yeah. the wind and the rain kind of blowing through there. That's oh. great, though. My big goal was to really make it feel real. Lights up. feel like we took motion picture cameras into the world of Tron and shot it. So I wanted to build as many sets as possible. I wanted the materials to be real materials, glass, concrete, steel. So it had this kind of visceral quality to it. All right, so we're going into sacred territory. This is Kevin Flynn's secret lab. And what this space uh, is meant to, to tell the story is this uh, takes the place of the lab in the first movie. This is one of my favorite details from Home again. I hope we get it uh, picked up, but this is actually the MCP uh, desk caddy. <laughs> and it's from the first movie. This film, to our benefit, did create a lot of great sort of brand sets to be able to, you know, not have to pretend so much. I think the juxtaposition between kind of the real world and the textures and the colors and the tones and the materials that we kind of see in the, the first few minutes of the film are going to hopefully be so sharply contrasted by the clean surfaces and the really clean lines and charm. So that was definitely an intention. This is one of our bigger sets of the film. Uh, 
we have four large sets, this probably being uh, one of the, the larger ones. This is a solid glass floor, it's an uplift glass floor. Uh, we're about uh, 10 feet off the stage, uh, on the soundstage floor. Light is an integral part of our design process on this film. Everything from the fireplace is lit to the tables lit to you know, we've got lighting on the air conditioning vents and there's lighting in the pool. Lots and lots of uh, set lighting in every pocket we can kind of cram it. So our suits actually glow and throw light on the other actors in the sets, so it's practical. It's split, man. It was really about innovating technology. It was taking things that we already knew and pushing the envelope. That was the goal, really, to say, here's the first, here's the technological advancement in a costume for a movie. Here's a world that's all digital. There's not really going to be a seamstress. That was really the hardest part, is to kind of get your head around, wait a minute, now, how are things made? If it's all materialized, then we don't need buttons, we don't need zippers, we don't need any kind of enclosures. So how do we put stuff together? How does somebody get dressed? And we had to come up with a way to sew fabric together so that it didn't look like it was stitched together. Neville, Page, and Joe Kaczynski had worked on concept art. They had these incredible sweeping line gestures, like these beautiful concepts for the costume with light everywhere. <laughs> and you're going, but wait, his arm has to bend. And when he takes the disc, you know, I've never seen a light that could move like that on someone's body without breaking. How do we do this? What we do here is we take the designs of the costumes and we start with a sculpting process. After those pieces are cast and body shopped, the final molds are made. These costumes are special effects costumes and what makes it special effects costumes is the fact that we are adding light to all the costumes. These are all foam rubber suits. They all have integrated electronics that are inside them. Uh, completely flexible, even the lights are flexible overall. With inside this foam rubber suit is a whole matrix of wiring, and they all start from a centralized place in the back where we actually connect into. This will drive all the power. Ready to go clubbing. four layers, right? So I have like a bit of foundation, which kind of sucks everything in, and then like a barrier, and then like this other electronics thing, hence the uh, lights, and then this part, which is like a latex balloony type material that kind of, you know, sticks on. <laughs> The technology to do these types of films has grown in such leaps and bounds since the first film, and really the sky's the limit. It's kind of whatever you can really conceive, you can pretty much bring to flourishing. We're the next generation of 3D cinematography after Avatar, so it takes all that technology that Jim Cameron came up with into the, to the next level. It's different. Shooting this movie in 3D was, I think, the, the right decision to be made, and it was a lot of foresight on Joe's and Disney's part to, to make that decision. From the very beginning, Joe wanted to make it immersive 3D kind of window. When we go into the computer, you're going to see something you've, you've never really seen before. Cut. We had to create everything in this world. So between the environments, the vehicles, and our digital character, Visual Effects has been working on this film for about two years. roughly a little over 1,500 shots in this film, but with layout uh, approvals, animation approvals, 3D approvals, it's roughly like 6,000 plus shots, it feels like. Knowing that this Clue character was gonna be Jeff Bridges at, at this earlier age, that was incredibly challenging, and we really had a goal of pushing that to the next level. You are a very rare bird, aren't you? On set, and Jeff would give his performance, and then they had a body double named John Reardon would study that performance, and he would act out the scene sort of mimicking the way that Jeff Bridges performed it. And then we basically cut off John Reardon's head in the computer and put in the digital clue head. I took the system 
to its maximum potential. I created the perfect system! Jeff Bridges will actually create the all-digital character, as opposed to animators kind of interpreting what Jeff Bridges might do. You'll all be wearing these next year. This is the latest style. This is four little lipstick cameras, a face-up. And so when Jeff is performing or talking, those cameras record those little dots so that later on in the post-production process, they can use that to drive this specific animation rig for Jeff. Of course you're right. Enjoy the drink. It's very gratifying to know that I can play myself or the character that I'm playing at any age. It's really the beginning of a whole new era of filmmaking. From a designer point of view, it was just a kind of a dream come true to assemble a team of designers that I thought were the best in every field and bring them together and create this amazing art department. What I think Joe and his vision have brought to it is a real sense of detail, photorealism, physics, jeopardy that, truthfully, just wasn't achievable in 1982. That was the first goal, making sure that we leave a, you know, an indelible design mark on this film. Much like Sid did on the first film, and we want to make sure that our designs and our look are enough of a leap.